The book that I'll be using in this video is my CPT 2022. And as you guys can see, I do not have any tabs um, in this book. That's because all my tabs are still in my 2021 book. And I will go back to this book here and there, but lately I've been wanting to use the 2022 book just to see if I'm able to remember the notes that I have in this book. Um, without having to pull this book out. I mean, I love having this one because of all my notes. This is like my journal, but the other one, it's nice to see a nice clean book. Um, so let me see here. If I go to the female genital system, you guys will see that these were all my notes that I have in here. Um, this was pretty much when I first started my specialty. So I wanted to make sure that I had a lot of notes and information in my book to help me um, as I was coding. So to go from all this information to a nice, clean, crisp book is, I thought it would be a challenge at first, but I kind of remember the notes that I have because of seeing it every day. So that's why I'm not too worried about it. I probably won't give it away or sell it just because, you know, I feel like I'm too attached to this book and I, I really, really love the the effort and the time that I put in it to write it. It's, I'm serious, it's like a journal to me. So yeah, when it comes to how I tab my book, obviously I'm going to tab it related to my specialty and the services that I review. So I'm not going to tab other sections in the book, for instance, cardiology or um, musculoskeletal, those types of things my um, providers do not do. So I'm not going to tab it. And um, for any of you guys that are new to coding and you're trying to figure out how you should tab your book, I would just use the tabs that they provided in the very front of your book. So when you're preparing for your um, CPC exam, I would use these tabs. I wouldn't take the time to like write information down like how I have Nexplanon, incision and drainage because I doubt you're gonna have any Nexplanon procedures on your exam. Um, you really don't need to mark down skin tags like I do because they're really trying to um, just test you on are you paying attention to the guidelines? Do you know how to apply appropriate modifiers? And those type of things are not going into details with like specialties. Um, like um, when I say going into details with specialties, you're not gonna have 20 questions on cardiology, for example. I believe they break it down to like five questions per section or something like that. Um, and they have changed it because when I took the CPC exam, it was 150 questions and now it's 100 questions. So now they probably even um, lessen the amount of questions per section even more. So definitely use the tabs that they gave you in the front for your CPT book. Um, I believe the Hicks Picks book already comes tabbed by letter. So you don't really have to worry about tabbing that one and I don't have that one on hand it's over here in my shelf down at the bottom actually and I don't feel like pulling it out but that one has the letters on it and then when it comes to ICD-10 I would tab the letters like I have but make sure you include all of them I only have the ones that are the diagnosis codes that I commonly use so you see I don't have a tab let me see in the very first section, I have the index tab, but I do not have a tab for A's. I have a tab for C and D. I don't have a tab for any of the ones in between. So like um, G, I don't have tab. H, I don't have tab. I, I don't have tab. And that's because we rarely report those diagnosis codes. So if you are trying to figure out what you should tab for ICD-10, I would tab the letters just so that you can get there quicker after reviewing what you need to review in the index. So 
So again, I would not tab things like I have tabbed, for instance, the twins, the polyhydramnios, the scars, failed induction of labor. If you're taking your CPC, you do not need to tab what I have tabbed. Just tab your um, different chapters in your ICD-10 book. Right now, I am looking at some denials that I have mainly for my, what is it, my neonatology specialty. I get a lot of denials for this because um, most of the time, the mother's name, which is the guarantor, ends up on the claim. And they are denying because my reason code is CO6, and that is procedure or revenue code inconsistent with patient age. So the code that I'm billing and the diagnosis code that I'm using is actually correct for the newborn. So I will just have to send it back um, to our billing team and let them know that this was billed correctly. It looks like the baby was not named yet, which is crazy because the baby is 11 weeks old and they still haven't decided on a name. Hmm. So the mother's name was on the claim, so that's probably why they're denying this. Everything else looks good, so I'm just going to send this back. billing for the guarantor. Did I spell that right? Guarantor. There we go. Okay, so I can send that one out and then I have how many more to do? Okay, so there's another one. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten for the exact same thing. <laughs> and I'm just going to send these all over, but first I'm gonna check the diagnosis codes because sometimes um, they come back because of the diagnosis codes too. So let me look at all of these and just make sure they're all good. I don't see any comments from our billing team, so I'm just gonna go ahead and reply back that these were billed correctly. Alrighty, so I sent all 10 of those back. 
so I have one more to go and this one is for payment included in payment for other services and this is the initial um, hospital neo neonate admission so and this is to NICU and the patient is not in critical condition but is still admitted to NICU and it looks like we also build the attendance at delivery. Um, so let me just go over to my newborn just to make sure I find you. Actually, I think we do put a 25. Now that I'm thinking about it, I think we do add a 25 to the 99477 usually. Okay, so newborn care services. It looks like right over here, and sorry, you guys can't really see it, but I'll make a note to show you guys. Page 61, it says the initial day neonatal intensive care code 99477 can be used in addition to 99464, which we are billing when the physician or other qualified healthcare professional is present for the delivery. Um, and then it says, in the situation report, 99477 with modifier 25. So I'm gonna go ahead and make the correction to add modifier 25. And I'm gonna add in the same comment. Alrighty, so our denials are done. I'm not sure how quickly or how slowly I did that, but we're gonna move on and see if I have any claim errors or claim edits that I need to correct. It looks like we have one that needs an LMP attached to it. And that is the last menstrual period. I don't know what's been going on, but um, when I add the LMP lately, it doesn't give me credit for making a correction. It just says that it's no longer in my work queue. And then it goes away and I don't even get a point for it. So I don't know. My next one I have is a charge in my work queue. So let me see. Why isn't it showing me the error? All right, what's the patient's last name? And the date of service is the 9th. So let's see here. We are billing a auditory screening for a newborn. Okay, and I already know um, the diagnosis code that I'm gonna use. Since it was a normal hearing test, I'm gonna use the Z01.10 as my primary diagnosis code. There were some other codes on here that the provider chose, so I'm just going to leave those on there and go ahead and send this out. And then this one that is in my claim edit work here should go away. Yep, it did. So I actually get a point for that one because I got the green check. And then let me see because I have two circumcisions here. It looks like we had twins. So, um, twin boys that we're going to do a circumcision on each of them, or that we did do. And I just have to see what else was billed because we might have to put a 25 on the E&M. 
Okay, so it looks like a different specialty built the ENM, so we don't have to worry about adding the 25. Let me just double check with the other baby. Yep, same thing. So I can review these circumcisions and um, go ahead and send them out. My diagnosis code I'm using is Z41.2. And let me just look at the documentation. Okay. This one is soon good to go. I just have to change the billing provider. Let me look at my schedule here. Okay, so I finished those two circumcisions, and now what I'm doing is I'm getting ready to start my coding. Um, I'm just going to start working from my oldest date, and what I've been doing is I'm just combining all my specialties together. So I have my OB practice, and then I have my neonatology offices, well not offices, but specialty and then um, the Peds Hospitalist. So I can start with either one. Um, usually the neonatology and the Peds Hospitalist is easy to get out because a lot of the times all I have to do is a diagnosis change. I really don't have to audit the levels. So let me just weed through those really quickly okay so i'm finished with those specialties now i'm getting ready to go ahead and begin with ob and ob i get more of a you know cpt range of codes and diagnosis codes so let's go ahead and jump into those i just finished doing an outpatient surgery the patient was seen for a stage two systole seal and stage two rectal seal. And what we did for her was a anterior and posterior coporphy. So I reported the 57260. And then she also had mixed urinary incontinence. So what they did to treat that was they did the sling operation for stress incontinence. So my diagnosis codes, I'm going to link the ones that were for each procedure performed. So let me get out of this OB section and I'll show you guys the codes that I reported. Okay, so for the prolapse, which is the cystocele, it was stage two. So I reported the N81.2, and then she also had a rectal seal, which would be the posterior part, so N81.6. And those were linked to the 57260, and then she also had mixed urinary incontinence. So I'm just gonna go up to my tab that I have for incontinence. And I'm going to find N39, which one was it? It was 46. Yep, next page. Up here at the top, mixed incontinence, which is urge and stress incontinence combined. So this code was linked to the 57288 which is there, and the other one went with the 57260, which is right here. I did not use a 51 modifier, but if you're taking your exam, you want to make sure that you use the 51 on, which one would it be? I believe the 57288 would go first and the 57260 would go second. I can't remember how um, I sequenced them because I actually did this one a little bit earlier. But um, 
yeah, you want to make sure you have modifier 51 on one of them, which indicates that it was multiple procedures performed. And I don't have my tabs on here, so I'm going to try and like just jump over to that section really quick, which is Appendix A, and show you guys modifier 51. Right here, when multiple procedures other than E&Ms are performed. Next up, I have an office procedure where the patient came in because she had a vulvar abscess and we did an IND. So I'm just going to go right here to 56405, which is right underneath the vulva, perineum, and introitus section. And we are going to go ahead with the 56405 because this was a vulva abscess. And my diagnosis code I'm reporting is N76.2. Right here. You can see that abscess of vulva. So that was my next procedure. Okay, so now I'm working on a vulvar biopsy in the office and the patient, well actually pathology is telling me that there is hyperpigmentation changes um, on the from the left labia minora. So when I go to hyperpigmentation, it says see also pigmentation. So I'm gonna go over there and hope that they have something related to the vulva. So let me skim through my pages here until I get to pigmentation. And it looks like we have abnormal, animale, or we have these other options here. None of them are really for the genitalia, so I might have to go with the L81.9. So let me just go over there to see if they send me somewhere else. other disorders of pigmentation and then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to see if they will um, allow that code for the 56605 CPT code that I'm billing because this was only for one biopsy so I'm just going to have to go with the L81.9 because I didn't see any other diagnosis code that was related to what pathology had found. And that is a diagnosis code that the uh, provider is um, using as well. So we're just going to go with L81.9 and fingers crossed that it gets paid. <laughs> All right, next up, I just did a, um, what is this? An outpatient surgery for a missed abortion and I've used the 002.1 diagnosis code and because this was a missed abortion the patient did not have any vaginal bleeding so this was not an incomplete abortion I'm going to go to our abortion codes and then I'm going to use the treatment of a missed abortion and she was in between six and seven weeks. So this would be the first trimester. So my CPT code that I'm going to report is the 59820. Next up, I have a colposcopy of the cervix with um, biopsies and endocervical curatage. So that is gonna be the 57454. The diagnosis code that the provider had used was the ASCUS with positive high-risk HPV um, on the cervix. And that code is the R87612, I believe. But looking at pathology, 
they came up with SIN1, which is low grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. And when the patient has SIN1, we report N87.0. And you see here the excludes ones tell us not to report the R8761 codes. And that ASCUS is that R8761 too. So I'm gonna change that code to the N87.0. And um, the R87810 for the um, cervical high risk for HPV testing positive, we can keep that code. So those are my two diagnosis codes that I'm gonna report with the 57454.